Then the next thing and final thing we'll come into for today is the Fitzpatrick skin type. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about wavelengths and the solar spectrum. It's more so that I can wrap up and talk about vitamin uh, D making lamps and whether they're a good or a bad idea. Hello and welcome, I'm Sarah and in this video I'm going to go over some aspects to do with making vitamin D and why some people are good at it and why others aren't and also explain a little bit about wavelengths of light uh, because there's an up and coming really good interview with somebody called Scott Zimmerman who's an expert in light especially near infrared light so it's a way to get people up to speed. If you want to join the channel I offer now something where for a small fee I'll prioritize answer to your questions uh, and comments and also I have a membership group if you want to go deeper into quantum biology and health and science with me. Very briefly, vitamin D is very important for many processes in the body, ranging from immunity, managing appetite, bone metabolism, managing the levels of certain minerals like calcium in the body, um, preventing cells from becoming cancerous, but also a lot more. So it's something really important that relates to lots of different parts of our bodies. And very interestingly, there's vitamin D receptors deep down in the mitochondria because vitamin D is also a non-visual photoreceptor uh, like cholesterol. And it's involved in the light show in the body. And it's also involved uh, in part in sort of it can store light. So therefore it's a sort of energy gauge or it can store energy from light in your body. However, we're going to digress from that for today. So the very first step in making uh, vitamin D is we need some UVB light. So this comes from the sun and only about five to 10% of the UVB actually penetrates and gets down to earth. And UVB is in the 280 to 315 nanometer range. And then after the cholesterol gets basically cracked um, or, or open by the UVB light, there are many, many steps uh, to get to the final product of the active vitamin D. And the kidney and the liver participate in this. So there's lots and lots of intermediates or pre-vitamin Ds. If you, if you use supplements, which is up to you what you do, they skip over lots of the steps. So it's basically you're missing out on some of the intermediates. But on the other hand, there are certain circumstances where vitamin D supplementation can be useful, such as an acute infection and also some cancer, cancer protocols included. However, with anything that you can make that you take, you do run the risk of uh, shutting down your own natural production. But again, with supplements, that's completely up to you what, what you do. What dictates how good you are at making vitamin D. So we'll go through some of the factors. The first one is age. And as you get older, it, it just becomes more difficult to produce uh, vitamin D. Secondly, which is interesting, is body fat percentage, because there is a correlation uh, between obesity and low levels of vitamin D. But also what's interesting about this is it, it, it's in part that the body fat can get in the way of the vitamin D production in very simplistic terms. But also when vitamin D is measured, it's measured in the serum and it's well documented that fat stores vitamin D. So it's not completely definitively proved whether the fat is storing the vitamin D and it did actually get made. It's just it can't be liberated until the fat cells open and the vitamin D comes out. But in terms of just a ballpark. The bigger somebody is, as in the more body fat, that at the moment the studies send, tend to say that it is harder to make vitamin D, but the, the jury's out into whether this is completely accurate or not. Next we've got SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, so looking at genetics. Um, because again, genetically, somebody say from Finland, because there's hardly any sun there, they need to be sort of top notch genetically at making vitamin D, whereas somebody whose um, heritage is from somewhere warmer and they still live there, there's that much sun that they don't it, it, they don't um, need to suck every last uh, molecule of um, UVB out of the atmosphere to make uh, vitamin D. 
so we won't go deep into this, but also I think there are now about 30 SNPs um, maybe involved in how well somebody can make vitamin D. And it's not just the vitamin D process that I just showed you. It's also your vitamin D receptor. So the receptors is like a button that the vitamin D presses and then something happens. So people can have variations in how well they respond to vitamin D. So even if someone has quite low levels, they might have a receptor that's very, very responsive. And also, like I said before, there's a big light element in vitamin D. And obviously vitamin D uh, made that the sun was involved in that's charged with light is going to be di a different form uh, on a quantum level to vitamin D made in a factory. The next factor is uh, the UVI index. So it really does need to be over five, although it probably is possible for certain people to make vitamin D at UVIs of three to four. So the UVI index is sort of just measuring how much, in simple terms, how much UVB light is there. And there are apps like DMinder that can tell you how much UVI there is in your location at a given time. And it can estimate based on this, how many clouds there are out, how naked you are out in the sun, how much vitamin D you can make. So again, your vitamin D making ability might be not you. It might be the fact you live somewhere where there isn't any UVB, say at the moment in the UK and other Northern hemispheres, or it might be very cloudy. But the other factor is if you live somewhere where there's very, very high UVI, it's really easy to get burnt, which sort of discourages people from, from going out too often. So more isn't necessarily always better. The next thing is magnesium levels, because with magnesium, there's all sorts on the market, but you, but you need magnesium that can get right inside the cell. And people take magnesium supplements, often the incorrect ones, and that particular form can't get in the cell properly. And we do need uh, magnesium to be able to participate or help in many of those reactions to make uh, vitamin D. So, so that can be a factor. Then we've got non-native EMFs and, and other kinds of uh, light pollution because it does disturb the, the pathway of the light to the body. So I won't go into this in massive detail, but anybody who lives in a place where there's lots of non-native EMFs, lots of sun and lots of blue light, even though they've got all the sun all the UVB in the world, they still have trouble making it. So it possibly is their physiology, but also there is a big correlation with places like California, where there's three Van Ellen belts that go over it. So a lot of non-native EMFs, people do have great tans, but then they don't have great vitamin D levels. Then the next thing and final thing we'll come into for today is the Fitzpatrick skin type. So here we have an example of Fitzpatrick skin types, and we've got the type one, which is the very light, uh, pale, say with uh, auburn hair, ginger hair, very blue eyes. And according to this, it's claimed that these people uh, always burn and they never tan. This isn't strictly true because they can build a solar callus correctly by gently exposing themselves to the sun um, say in the morning or in sunrise times when it's not too intense. So they can over time carefully build a tan. But then we go up to a type two, type three, type four, five and six. So a type uh, six would be very, very dark. Uh, and then we've got sort of olive skin, which is in the middle at type four. So, so what happens here is these people burn uh, mildly if you've got a higher Fitzpatrick skin type, but also it's harder for them to make vitamin D because there's effectively a barrier of melanin in the way. And this is just how evolution is uh, to protect people. Uh, but all it means is the darker your skin, the harder it is for you to make vitamin D. But like I said, there are other factors uh, involved in the equation as well. So if we move into this now, I just want to talk a little bit about wavelengths and the solar spectrum. It's more so that I can wrap up and talk about vitamin D making lamps and whether they're a good or a bad idea. Again, it's like supplement, it's completely up to you. But also it helps people understand podcasts like the one with Scott Zimmerman, but also future podcasts with people like Dr. Cruz or Max, where they are going to be talking about wavelengths and different parts of the spectrum. 
And here we can see we have a spectrum. So we've gone all the way from X-rays all the way up to radio waves. And in terms of how much energy th these particular waves carry, we can in simple terms say that high energy means short wavelength and high frequency, although there are many other ways you can describe light because it's not just a wave, it's a particle as well because it's it has a quantum aspect to it. But just for simplicity now, we'll say waves with high frequency and short wavelength are going to carry lots of energy. So we've got things like X-rays and then ultraviolet. Then we go into the visible light and blue light's got more um, energy than red light. And also blue light is the one that bends th the most, but it's not the one that penetrates the body the most. And once we move out of the visible uh, spectrum, we get into the infrared and the near infrared is what Scott wants to talk about because it's very interesting and it gets neglected. So this comes after red light and it's about 800 nanometers up to about 2000. And where I'm going to with this is when we talk about the sun and what it emits, we can see some of the light, which is in the visible, but then there's the invisible light that we can't see, the ultraviolet and the near infrared. And interestingly, the ones we can't see appear to uh, do the most uh, to the body so far. On the subject of tanning beds and sunbeds, there are a wide variety available. So if we're talking about something like a spurty lamp, we're talking about a UV light. And with a spurty, it's in the UVB. The spurty lamp also has UVA in it as well. So what we've done with these kind of this tanning lamp is in this great big spectrum of light that we have from the sun and all of these wavelengths all do something. Um, we've taken one piece out without all the rest of the light, without the infrared or anything to, to balance it with and decided to, to use just that wavelength to make vitamin D. So this isn't a bad thing and there are studies. However, um, as I move forward in the world of quantum biology, I have realized there's spectrums of things everywhere and sometimes things do function as a group. So if you do have a spurty lamp or you do want to use a UVB sunbed, it is a much better idea to take a red light with you and use that or open the window or use the spurty lamp outside. And on the subject of sunbeds, there are extremely sophisticated ones. And I was looking at the spec of some gigantic mega sun uh, sunbed recently, and it's got UVAB, uh, yellow light to, to balance the UVB. I don't know the physics behind that yet. And it's also got red and infrared. So there are alternatives within reason that have benefits and do make vitamin D. Sunbeds all, and these kind of bulbs and lights all come with warnings, so nothing's completely safe. It's just a way to explain to you um, why vitamin D is really important, what makes it, what kind of light does it, what are the options if I haven't got a sun, and then to lead people in uh, to this idea of all these different wavelengths and this spectrum and what these numbers mean so that when in later podcasts they get discussed, you'll have a better idea. You may know everything already and there's going to be lots of people that know more than me. I just wanted to make it maybe more simple for people who are just getting into this and might feel overwhelmed about what somebody means when they talk about wavelength. So hopefully uh, this is helpful if, if that's you. And in saying that, it's probably not the best time of year to talk about vitamin D if, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, but again, in Australia and elsewhere at the equator, there is vitamin D because that's another option. Some people, in order to get the vitamin D, they actually need to go away somewhere. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it useful. And I've got a lot more videos coming out in the new year. So all the podcasts are recorded. So there's Jack Cruz part two, Dr. Stephanie Seneff again on the channel, Dr. Catherine Clinton, Matt from Cultivate Elevate, The Hydrogen Man, Scott Zimmerman. So look out for those. If you're also interested in learning about nutrition from a quantum perspective, I've got a new course out and it's on minerals. And I think it's something that a lot of people would find useful and interesting and the links are in the description. So thank you very much and goodbye.